One Man's Quest to Build a Bridge. It's a story of corruption and intrigue. There are plenty of colourful characters and even a Viking. We are Tasmanian. These are our stories. This is Forgotten Tasmania. The story starts with the waters of the eastern Midlands in Tasmania. The first people of the area were the Cherenotopana, a nomadic tribe who roamed from the central plateau to the eastern tiers. Tombs Lake was an Aboriginal meeting place called Moyantalia, and it drained into what was become the Macquarie River, which was then called Tina Maracuna. It was named after the Governor of New South Wales, Lachlan Macquarie. In 1821, he went by horse and cart through the rough tracks of the Midlands. This was a pretty significant journey and the 200th anniversary is coming up next year. On that trip Macquarie also named Perth, Campbelltown, Oatlands, Brighton, Sorrell and in honour of HM Buchanan's seat on Loch Lomond, a small sheep station was named Ross. The events of that trip are recorded in a diary kept by Macquarie. The diary offers a window into Van Diemen's Land in the early 1800s and it's now available online which makes it an excellent research tool. The first bridge at Ross was built a year later in 1822. They did a quick and dirty build and that bridge didn't last long. In 1828 Nicholas Turton, the inspector of roads, visited because the two central piers had collapsed. In 1829 Governor George Arthur ordered that the bridge be repaired by the army. That order was met with a saga of incompetence and corruption that would mean a new bridge would take seven years to complete. Governor Arthur was not well liked in the colony. His style of hard discipline and punishment at Port Arthur had earned him a bad reputation. He shifted responsibility for the convicts from the government to the free settlers that the convicts were assigned to. The landowners didn't like Arthur's style and longed for representative government, elections and a free press. The bridge saga started when the Royal Staff Corps arrived in Ross at the worst possible time of year. The winter rains had flooded the area, making bridge work impossible. Their commander, Lieutenant Varchel, is best described as disinterested. The only work he managed to get done was to cut a pile of logs. He was recalled and replaced with Alexander Jackson, who did manage a temporary fix. When the next inspector of roads, Mr Roderick O'Connor, arrived in 1830, there was little evidence of any progress towards a permanent solution. A year later, the old bridge collapsed again and the situation became desperate. Mr William Ford had been working on the barracks at Bothwell. He was sent in to supervise construction of a new bridge. O'Connor was now favouring a crossing point about 100 metres from the old bridge. This suited Ford because he wasn't so interested in building a bridge. Although new brick and stone buildings popped up all over Ross and Ford made a killing on the black market. There was a dispute over the location for the new bridge. In June of 1832, government civil engineer John Lee Archer finally gave in to O'Connor and settled on the new site, although the construction would be out of stone. In March of 1833, O'Connor recommended convict James Colbeck as superintendent of construction, but Archer had already hired Shadrick Purton and George E. Cock. Then in November of 1833, Charles Atkinson was appointed by Governor Arthur. The lack of progress prompted Governor Arthur to send Jorgen Jorgensen to investigate. He was the Danish son of a royal watchmaker. Once you start saying anything about Jorgensen, it's hard to stop because this was a Danish adventurer who did so much in his life, around the world twice, had so many adventures, that it is an absolutely amazing story. In 1809 he sailed to Iceland and declared the country independent of Denmark and himself as the ruler. Two months later the Danish government was restored and Jorgensen was sent to England as a prisoner of war. He uh, was let out of prison and in London, providing he'd left England. He didn't. He liked London. He hung around. It was like a love affair with the British and with London. It was... He was caught, arrested, sentenced to be hung. Jorgensen had his sentence commuted after he wrote a letter to an influential friend who intervened on his behalf. What's that man doing in England? He's supposed to be... And he was put 
on the next ship convict transport out of England. In 1801, he joined the crew of the Lady Nelson and was present at the establishment of Risdon Cove in 1803. He was imprisoned several times, but that didn't stop him appearing at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, before ending up in Van Diemen's Land again in 1826. A year after that, he foiled a plot to pass forged treasury bills, which eventually earned him a pardon. He was a constable in the infamous Black Lion military operation against the Aboriginals in 1830. Jorgensen was appointed by Governor Arthur to investigate all the delays and find out why the bridge wasn't getting built. I thought using a former convict sounded a bit desperate. No, it wasn't an act of desperation. Uh, it was actually a, uh, a, considered, a considered appointment because uh, Jorgensen had been very successful in the field police. In 1833, Jorgensen was met with an actual stone wall of silence from the people of Ross. Perhaps they were enjoying their stone and brick houses too much to risk everything by talking to him. Incidentally, the term stonewalling came into effect at the American Civil War of 1861, so my use of that word isn't strictly accurate here. Architect Charles Atkinson was dismissed in 1835, though he stayed in Ross to continue work on St John's Church of England. I get the feeling that Governor Arthur was getting frustrated to say the least. He'd sent six different people tasked with building him a bridge, and they'd all failed to do so. In May of 1835, Colbeck and another convict, Daniel Herbert, were put on the project and supervised by Captain William Turner of the 50th Queen's Own Regiment. He admitted knowing nothing of bridge building and he left the project to Colbeck and Herbert. James Colbeck was a stonemason from Yorkshire living in London. Unable to find work and starving, he broke into a house and was sentenced to transportation for life. That sentence forcibly separated him from his wife and son. In Van Diemen's Land, he worked on the new orphan school building and was then sent to Ross. But at that time, the bridge was being built out of wood. And being a stonemason, he was reassigned to Mr. William Commode, who was building a property called Mona Vale. Colbeck's earnings were banked by Commode, whose son was going to England, and he was going to arrange passage for Colbeck's wife and son. But I don't think that ever happened. Daniel Herbert was also a stonemason. He was sentenced to death in 1827 for highway robbery. That sentence was commuted to transportation to Van Diemen's Land. Colbeck and Herbert were promised their freedom if they could complete the bridge. Before accepting, Herbert asked to delay their departure from Hobart Town so he could marry Mary Witherington, which he did. The deal for their pardons paid off, and a year later the bridge was complete. Two convicts had project managed a stone bridge into existence in only 13 months, where others had failed to do so in the previous six years. Governor George Arthur got his bridge, but Daniel Herbert had decorated it with 186 carvings. These carvings are still the subject of mystery 184 years later. Some are recognisable, and many people have speculated on who these carvings are and what they represent. The Ross Bridge is allegedly the only stone bridge in the world with carvings all the way around the arches. This just wasn't done. The bridge was delayed already, so no superintendent would have approved extra time for the carvings, and there's no record of any approval. The 1971 book by Leslie Greener suggests that Herbert's Celtic background may have influenced the carvings. Over the years, the true meaning of the carvings has been lost, if it was ever known by anyone other than Herbert himself. The best speculation is that the faces include Herbert, his wife Mary, William Commode, William Turner, and Jorgen Jorgensen, to name a few. A cheeky parody of George Arthur appears on the bridge, and Arthur's name appears in the inscription at the centre. The bridge was officially opened on July 14, 1836, and Governor George Arthur was recalled and left office in October of 1836. There was much public rejoicing as Arthur wasn't well liked. He is best, or perhaps worst, remembered for the penal colony of Port Arthur. The real heroes are Colbeck and Herbert. Colbeck got his pardon in 1841, and in 1843 was listed on the census as living in the West Tamar region. By 1850, he was back in England, remarried and living in Yorkshire, he died in 1852. Herbert was pardoned in 1842 and stayed in Ross, where he worked as a stonemason. His carvings appear on a number of buildings, including St Luke's Church at Bothwell, the sundial at the Royal Botanical Gardens in Hobart, and his own tomb in Ross. He died in 1868. He was survived by his wife and three children. There's a model in the Wool Museum, but his real tomb is in the Ross Cemetery. The Ross Bridge provided more intrigue and mystery than I'd ever expected. I hope you enjoyed the story. Catch you in the next one. Cheers.